They didn't find anybody and no one went to jail. They find the corporation. Ivan Borsky, the insider trader, paid a hundred million dollars in fines and Milken just paid six hundred million dollars in fines. Not, not, not the money he had in fines. John Johnson of Johnson Publishing is only worth $200 million. Milken paid three times his net worth in a criminal penalty. In the Pentagon scandal, defense contractors, mostly run by white men, ripped off $50 billion. The savings and loans scandal may go to $500 billion. Where is the set-aside? Where is the 10% set-aside? Where is the equal opportunity? Where is the 8A for us? Where is our criminal money? I tell you where it is, and I don't condone it. Steal a car. Snatch a purse. Shoplift, and you'll go to jail for two, three, or five years. I don't condone any of that, but when you can steal a whole nation as Richard Nixon did and not spend a minute in jail, or when you steal so much money as Yvonne Borsky did that you don't know how much he stole and you can go to court in a limousine or milking with $600 million, did not dip the amount of money he stole and probably will spend no money, no time in jail, then there's something wrong with the very legal system that is supposed to protect you. Now, we've had one or two excursions into the big time criminal world. As a matter of fact, last summer, they had a brother who tried to rob a bank in Michigan, got the money, but then he got caught in the turnstile going the wrong way, couldn't get out. Trying to go out of a turnstile that says you come in. And while he was trying to get out of the turnstile, the police came and arrested him. But the brother tried to move to big time crime. In Chicago last summer, they had three brothers who tried to pull a stick up in the broad open daytime on the south side of Chicago, next door to 50 police officers. So we know everybody's stealing. So we just want to try to get a little bit too. We, we don't work in the computers, and I'm not condoning it. Don't misunderstand me. So we have to try to rob a bank down there and try to be bad. The brothers got inside the convenience store, got flustered, ran out, left the other brother. The other brother ran out behind him. They jumped in the car, left him, and he was running down the street trying to catch him. They found him up a tree. Another brother and his brother were indicted in Mississippi for conspiracy to commit murder by voodoo. <laughs> These are true stories. By voodoo. The judge had sent one of the brothers to jail for 40 years, and he said, get me a lock of his hair, get me a picture, and I'll take it to the voodoo priest. Well, now, under the law of attempted murder, there must be the apparent ability to carry out the act. So the, the law enforcement people in Mississippi must believe in voodoo. <laughs> then there was a white bank robber last summer in Oakland who was blind. Got someone to write the note for him? This is a stick up. This is a true story. You see, when everybody's trying to steal and the shortcuts, then everybody tries to get in, but you're not treated the same way. Gave the note to the teller, said it's a stick up. She didn't know he was blind. Gave him $8,000. Then he said, excuse me, could you show me how to get out of here? No, it's a true story. And then they knew he was blind, so they apprehended him. What I'm saying to you, it's not that black people or poor white people or Hispanics or Asians are more criminal than white males. It's that the justice system 
treats them differently and treats them in a favorite position. Why? Because America was founded on the premise of white male supremacy. And what they want from black people, whether they have a PhD, or whether they have a law degree, or whether they are educated, they really want black people in a subordinate position. They really want black people to do one thing in America. They want us to drive Miss Daisy. That's all they want. They want us to drive Miss Daisy, no matter how educated we are. Well, some of us are not going to drive Miss Daisy. Some of us are simply going to say to Miss Daisy, if you want to get where you're going, you're either going to walk or you're going to drive your damn self. We are not going to drive Miss Daisy. Even with an education, they want you to do that. I say this and I close so that we can have some questions. There is nothing wrong with being black. Unfortunately, black has developed such a bad connotation until some of our black students don't want to be black. What's wrong with being Hispanic if you're Hispanic? What's wrong with being Jewish if you're Jewish? What's wrong with being black if you're black? Listen. You must say about yourself and your culture, mine is no better than yours, but it's just as good. You see, young people, when you reject what you are, trying to be something that you aren't, and what you want to be rejects you, then you're trapped in a psychological twilight zone, useless to what you want to be and useless to what you are. I know it's hard, but I don't care how much education you get. I don't care how far you go economically. I don't care how big the diamond ring. I don't care how thick the fur coat. I don't care how fancy the boat or how fancy the car or how big the house. You cannot take the blackness off of your attic. So you do not have to get along with your white classmates and your white friends by trying to be white. Many before you have tried, and they have failed. So I don't want you, my young brothers and sisters, any more trying to be white than I want to see white students trying to be black. Now you take one black, one white student in a room full of blacks, and all of a sudden, where you at, blood? How you doing? I know it. Try to look hip because you think that's the way you get along. That's not the way you get along. You get along through a pluralistic circumstance. I don't have to be like you. You don't have to be like me. But I can respect you, and I want you to respect me. That's all we're asking for. And that's all you should deserve. And that's all you should demand. The reason I say this to you is because if you don't understand the racism in America, especially as young black students, if you don't understand it, then when you graduate from Iowa State, if you graduate from Iowa State and you go to work, you will think if you don't get that promotion, you will think if you don't get that advancement, you will think there's something wrong with you when the system is designed not to advance you, when the system is designed not to bring you in and you can't get white enough. You can't get male enough. You can't get anything enough to deal with that system. You had better be prepared to fight. But unfortunately, so many of our best trained, best educated, best prepared troops would rather switch than fight. Won't work. The education 
that you get here is designed to may be made in addition to your black experience and not a substitute for your black experience or your Jewish experience or your Hispanic experience or your white experience, whatever it is. The legitimacy goes both ways. That's all we're saying. And I firmly believe if you know something about the history, if you know something about where you come from, then you will have the pride in yourselves and in your culture and in your race to stand up and be what you are. You don't have to be anybody else. You can like Malcolm, Farrakhan, Martin, Garvey, Ida B. Wells. They are just as legitimate as John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson or anybody else. Finally, before I ask the questions, I want to leave you with the words of Frederick Douglass. It's not fair, but what we must understand is that it's not going to be easy in America if you're black or if you're female or if you're poor. Just not going to be easy. And if you fight, you may lose, but if you don't fight, you're guaranteed to lose. Frederick Douglass wrote, and I'll leave you with his words. And for those of you who don't know Frederick Douglass, black, white, or what have you, you ought to read some of this man. Frederick Douglass wrote in 1852, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom, but who deprecate agitation, are men who want crops, without plowing up the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and lightning, and they want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, but there must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Men may not get all that they pay for in this world, but they most certainly will pay for all that they get. Fight the power. Come on, you got some questions? Yes, sir. Stand up and tell me who you are and where you're from so I can know. Uh, can you uh, give us perhaps a few details of maybe your opinion on uh, the current Supreme Court case dealing with uh, desegregation in Louisiana? The higher education case in Louisiana? Well, when the uh, black universities and their 117 predominantly uh, historical black colleges were founded originally, they were given a white mission in Louisiana, Alabama, well, I should say that all of the black colleges are located in the deep southern states except three or four of them, Lincoln, uh, Cheney, and one or two others, Ohio, Central State. Uh, they were designed to segregate black students and white students from each other. Uh, in 1974, and it was against the law for blacks and whites to go to school in Louisiana, as a matter of fact, in the Supreme Court decision of Ghana versus Louisiana, the first city in demonstration case to get to the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Douglas noted that in Louisiana, it was against the law for blacks and whites to go to school together. It was against the law for blacks and whites to eat together in public. It was against the law for blacks and whites to go to sports events together. It was against the law for black and white uh, uh, musicians to play in the same band. As a matter of fact, he noted that in Louisiana during that period, black and white blind people were segregated. So that black colleges grew up in Louisiana in that context, in Texas and Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. In 1974, the Justice Department sued Louisiana, sued several other states, saying that they maintained a dual system of higher education, one for blacks and one for whites. In Louisiana, the case that we're dealing specifically with, you had Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Eight mile away, you had Southern University in the same city. In North Louisiana, you had Louisiana Tech University, the white university. In Ruston, 
You had Gramlin State University three miles away, one black and one white. Uh, they indicated that you have to have a unitary system of higher education, so you need one system. Well, the, the, the simple solution to that was to merge the black school into the white school, because again, the presumption is the white school is the best, so that the black school is inferior. Well, the black schools have had difficulty uh, in terms of facilities and in terms of monies, but they've never been inferior. In fact, I graduated from a black undergraduate school and law school, and if you look at most of the the so-called black leadership, most of them went to some black college, Jesse Jackson, uh, North Carolina A&T, Martin Luther King, uh, Morehouse College, Barbara Jordan, Texas Southern, Louis Farrakhan, Virginia Union, I believe. So what I'm saying is that although you had the segregated schools with blacks and whites, they educated the kids. What we found was that in this present climate, we argued that you cannot destroy the black schools because they have earned the right to exist. That what we need is more facilities and more money, and then whomever wants to come can come. Black schools never foreclose white students from coming. And white students went to LSU because they didn't want to go to Grambling and Southern in some instances. And of course, not until athletics came along that they want to deal with black students in any number, and then they still don't graduate them. At any rate, to make a long story short, the position that we've taken is that Gramlin has as much a right to exist as Louisiana Tech. They're not segregated, but that you cannot talk about equality or parity or equity with Gramlin until you catch up for the hundred years that you deliberately deprived us of facilities and of monies and programs. So we are now out of the Supreme Court, into the Fifth Circuit. I was in New Orleans on yesterday for a status conference. And we're now trying to determine whether or not an order which was issued on July 19th will, uh, will be enforced. The question that we have now, and it's a very interesting kind of a question that we're getting from blacks and whites, is if you support a black college, does that make you a segregationist? If you support a black mayor in Chicago, does that make you a racist? They are turning the worm on us. As a matter of fact, I had the distinction last year in March of being called a segregationist in Louisiana and a racist in Chicago. So I considered myself doing something right. <laughs> but that's what we, we, we're trying to deal with because still with the, the 117 black colleges having a smaller percentage of the black students attending than white students, we still graduate almost uh, 40 to 50 percent of the black students who graduate. Now when I went to college, I read at a seventh grade level. I was tested <clears throat> at reading at 7.5. Southern did not exclude me. Southern took me in and trained me, and in seven years made me a lawyer. Now, I, I'm not sure whether I could have gotten into Iowa reading at 7.5. I know I couldn't have gotten into Northwestern where I taught law school. So we, what we've done is the black schools are academically excellent. I want you to make that very clear. I mean, Gramlin has a computer science program, a nursing school. The nursing student just passed 100% of the exam. But the difference is we understand the deficiencies in the educational system that have deliberately crippled black people. And so what we do is we, we make the compensation for that. Now, after I graduated from Southern's Law School, I took a 21 and a half hour bar examination that was administered by all white lawyers in Louisiana and graded by white lawyers, and passed the first time. And when students ask me, well, what would you have done had you not passed the bar? And I, would, I respond to them all the time. The fact of not passing the bar never crossed my mind. It was never an option. I mean, I was never, I never believed, and never was told, and never was taught that I couldn't pass the bar examination. I never was told that I couldn't achieve. I never was called disadvantaged. I never was called minority. I never was called poor. I knew I was broke, <laughs> but I didn't know I was poor until I got up there and read Monaghan. I mean, in my house, my mama was the head of the house. My daddy was there, he provided, but mama ran the house. I mean, mama was the equalizer, the enforcer, the exterminator, the terminator, and the assassin. <laughs> but I didn't know that was matriarchal until I read Monaghan. See, I mean, so when you start teaching children and putting ceilings on them and telling them you can't achieve and you won't, 
The black colleges never did that. They were institutions of opportunity. We are now waiting to see whether or not we're going to have to uh, try the issue of liability. If you're a Supreme Court watcher, uh, the Mississippi case dealing with Jackson, Miss Jackson and Ole Miss uh, will be argued on bond in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals on June 29th. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little Where are you from? Where are you? I'm from Iowa. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on the FBI's assault on the Black Panther Party? Well, I was in Chicago at that time. As a matter of fact, I, I had two uh, points of view. On December 4th, 1969, uh, when the apartment uh, at 2337 West Monroe was raided and Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were assassinated uh, by the police officers, at that precise moment, I was an assistant United States attorney working in the United States Attorney's Office in Chicago uh, in the Civil Rights Unit. Uh, what we had found out earlier on, especially from 68, 66, 67, uh, especially from 68 on the COINTELPRO, the County Intelligence Program with Nixon and John Mitchell, is that the Black Panther Party had been infiltrated just as many of the white so-called radical groups had been infiltrated and that there was a, a feeling that blacks were about revolution. Fred Hampton and the Panthers teaching uh, power comes from the barrel of a gun. Uh, it was really believed. Uh, so when the, uh, when the black, when the days of rage took place in Chicago in August of 1968, uh, with white students from campuses at the Democratic National Convention. Chicago was under siege. Uh, it felt a siege mentality. Daly actually believed uh, that white students were going to put LSD in the water. They believed that ground up glass was going to be put in food in the Loop hotels. So that really was a, 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 power, a, a military response to it. So that in, in, in 68, after Dr. King's assassination and after the days of rage, the police force came under a lot of uh, uh, pressure from the right wing for not doing enough. And so Hanrahan, who really was going to be the next mayor of the city of Chicago, organized this raid at 4 o'clock in the morning, went in and really assassinated Fred. I saw Fred's uh, son about three weeks ago, uh, Deborah, who was in bed with Fred that night. Uh, we were all in a meeting together, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it's shown now that Fred Hampton never fired the only shot that was fired out of the apartment may have come from Mark Clark's gun, and he, we believe that it was fired as he fell backwards as they shot him through the door. Uh, it was a complete assassination, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but you may know that as a result of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark's assassination, as a result of the political activity after that, Hanrahan was defeated. We defeated Daly in 76. We defeated Daly's hand-picked a machine picked person uh, in 76. We, de we defeated the machine candidate in 1980 and 1982 and leading directly from the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark was the election of Harold Washington in 1983. So we turn the political movement against uh, black people into a political game for us, and Harold's election directly came from that because it politicized the black community. You see, when Fred and Mark were killed, those of you who may be criminal justice people or what have you, they never roped off the house because there was never the feeling that a crime had been committed. So the Panthers conducted guided tours through the house, and no one who went through that house and saw all of the bullet holes, saw the bloody mattress, saw all of that, no one who went through there, even if they didn't agree with the Panther rhetoric, they knew that an assassination had taken place that night. So it really politicized, politicized and galvanized the black community politically uh, to the point that Harold was elected. So it was not a total waste, although it was a waste. I saw another hand. Yes, sir. My name is Bill Studehar. I'm what? from Duluth, Minnesota, and I, growing up, I hardly saw a black person until I got out of high school, but I've got a question. Uh, being a lawyer, you're always concerned with uh, motive, and I'm wondering what you, this may, I may sound like a Nazi, but I don't, I mean no offense, but That's what's right. the motive for white people these days to keep black people down? I mean, we certainly, as 
white don't want to support you in the prison system, they don't want to support you on welfare, you're not going anywhere. So what's the motive? And I wonder if you'd respond to that. I think it's rac racism and it's this need to feel superior. It's the need to subordinate and to have the subordinate and superordinate relationship. And it's, uh, there's an economic aspect of it. See, by depressing or oppressing a person, you're able to exploit the labor. You're able to exploit them. You're able to exploit them from, from, the, from an economic standpoint. Malcolm X said that, the, that capitalism is, a, is a, a, a nation of blood suckers. And you've got to have somebody's blood to suck. You need, capitalism needs poor people. I mean. Uh, America operates on a premise of keeping about a 5% to 6% unemployment rate. That means that you've got to have some people unemployed so that the rest of the system fuels. In addition to that, you have to give the illusion of creating programs for poor people so that many uh, professionals can live. Uh, the welfare system, which is created for basically white farmers, and numerically more white people are on welfare than blacks, uh, support many white professionals and many white grocery stores and many white establishments because they live off of the system. So I think that, that there's a pure economic reason. Just as slavery had nothing to do with freeing blacks, it was an economic proposition whether the South was going to get all this free labor and what have you and control. The issue is who's in charge. The problem with it is, is that to manip for, for the one or one and a half percent of the white males who run America, it's important to keep the 99 percent at the bottom fighting each other over nothing. I mean, it's just that issue of control and who is in charge. I mean, how can Ronald Reagan be the president of anything? We're going to take uh, a few more questions in the blue. See a lady back there. Hi, my name is Cricket. My name is Cricket, and I'm from Minnesota. Okay. You did what to him? Well, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, being from the South, uh, the Confederate flag is uh, a symbol of total oppression of black people. I, I equate the, the Confederate flag with the Ku Klux Klan's uh, hood and what have you because it is designed really to, uh, it, it is the symbol of the full domination of black people. And the Confederate flag to a black person, at least to me, is like the, the Nazi swastika or what have you, the Jews. The only, problem, the only problem with it is, of course, is that you have a lot of Confederates who are now running the country. If you remember, uh, Ronald Reagan kicked off his campaign in Neshoba County, Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. For those of you who are history majors, you know that's where Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, the civil rights workers, were killed uh, in Montgomery where the Confederate flag flies above the state capitol, a black legislator climbed the capitol and took it down. Now, they arrested him uh, because of what you said. It is not the flag or the desecration of the Confederate flag. It is destroying somebody else's property, burning something that's not a leaf. Uh, but you have to understand, and I, and I want to make this very clear, that although you will hear the renunciation of the Confederate or the Southerner, that the white merchants were as much in complicity with slavery as the Southern plantation owner. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are religious and who are familiar with Amazing Grace, how sweet the son to save a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That song was written by a slave trader, Sir John Britton an Englishman who was white, who made a fortune trafficking in human flesh. So that although the Confederate flag represents the, 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 the symbol of oppression for many of us, we also go beyond that. But the, the, the Confederates had many more sympathizers than were in their ranks. 
So as a result of that, you have these arguments about free speech and what have you. Now Scott Tyler, Dred Scott Tyler, whose flag display on the floor of the Art Institute with the invitation to walk on it was designed to express free speech. But it had, the re it had a reactionary reaction from the same right wingers and some liberals who are now questioning your right to deal with the Confederate flag under some misguided notion of history. That's my opinion about it now. Y'all may not like it, but that's my opinion now. I, but you know what, the Confederate, you know what I mean? Iowa is a, is a state that, uh, you said you were from Duluth, they didn't have a lot of blacks, and maybe that's why they didn't have a black problem, but in, in, in places like uh, uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis where they have blacks, they have the same kind of problems. NAACP, I go up to speak for them all the time. But it's oppression. It's about oppression. And I, want, I say to you that slavery is as serious to me as the Holocaust is to the Jews. And I don't denigrate the Holocaust. That's, that's, a, that's a, a, a symbol of Jews that's important. That's important. But it's important to me that blacks who fought in World War II were treated worse than the white German soldiers who were prisoners of war. It's important to me that you don't know anything about the contributions made by black people. It's important to me that you don't really understand and really don't feel as if I have a right to feel that way about the South because I happen to be a lawyer and I happen to be look like I'm doing all right. But I feel that it's deeply and it's still there. I mean, it's still there. It's still there in Iowa. It's still there in Chicago. There are places in Chicago, a place called an island, you still can't buy a house. So all I'm saying to you is, is, is mine is no better than yours, but I don't want you to love me, I don't want you to accept me, but I will not have you disrespecting me. And if you, you know, if I'm in a position of authority and you've got a Confederate flag, it's your attitude. Attitude. Lady White. Lady White, yeah. Where are you from now? Davenport, across the river, Mississippi River. No, yes. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> so I quickly she said that. I said Mississippi. She said no. <laughs> yes, we are. Proposition. What's Proposition 40, uh, 48. 48. Oh, no, you said 26, yeah. Don't confuse me now, because I'm supposed to know all this. <laughs> proposition 48, the, the, the uh, so-called core curriculum for black athletes and what have you and that sort of thing, yeah. It's a trap. Well, Proposition 48 and 42, I guess it is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a lie and it's hypocritical. Uh, most of the big eight schools, big 10 schools that recruit black athletes who so have so-called admissions requirements have exceptions. What they do is they, uh, they, they have admission standards and then they have exceptions to allow anybody they want to come in. So they bring in athletes, as a guy said on the witness stand, cellists, you know, flutists. Well, they don't bring in that. They bring in football players, basketball players, and what have you. Uh, because simply, the fact is a simple fact, is that uh, football and basketball are big business. They bring in a lot of money. And they found out that we can shoot basketballs and play football, and they're not interested in educating us. As a matter of fact, that a federal judge either here or Minnesota who, who from the bench said that the, the athletes ought to be made professionals and not educators. But what you have to understand, again, about black schools is that, I just talked to Eddie Robinson two days ago, 80% of Grambling's football players graduate. Jackson State is a higher percentage than that. Where they are interested in the student athlete and not in the gladiator aspect of them to use them to fill up stadia to make money. They're, they're, they're traded like meat, and they're put into basket weaving, 
and put into other kinds of dead-end programs, and when they lose their eligibility, they let them go. Now, the reason that Proposition 48 and Dr. Johnson at Graham and I argued about that, I'm going to tell you one of the reasons that they, they started to deal with it. Major sports became too black. If you start looking at all of the, the athletes, I'm not talking about the cheerleaders now, if you look at the athletes, there was a time when I wouldn't look at Iowa, where Iowa always had one, but I wouldn't look at University of Alabama or Auburn. They never had any black players, Iowa State. But see, now the, the, he, the, the young black, the young white male is looking up to black athletes. The white male ego cannot take that. As a matter of fact, we had one professor at one of the schools say, how do I feel taking my son to a basketball game when all of the basketball players are black? He's worried about the impact on the psychic of his children, even where they're winning. When, uh, what's the guy at the Knicks? No, the, the uh, guy from the islands, the tall basketball player. You know what I'm talking about. No, no, from the Knicks. Uh, Ewing, Patrick Ewing. When he played at Georgetown, what did they do? The white students put up a monkey sign to, to, to show him that uh, you may think that you're great, but this is what we think of you, while he made all of this money for them. So the Proposition 48 was designed to exclude black athletes, not to educate them. And as a matter of fact, the schools, if you notice now, since the black athlete has had, it has had the greatest impact on black athletes, they now have passed an amendment to it which allows them to give them money the first year, even if they don't play, so they can bring them in. So it's all a trick. They lie and they cheat and they steal. As long as the black athlete is filling up the stadium, they'll find some way to use him or use her until they can't use them anymore, and then they'll let them go uneducated, send them back to the black community as they did with Kevin Ross, can't read, can't write, useless, and they're gone. The question about the black female and the male is very simple. The black male is a threatening figure to white America. Whether it's a, 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 a big, burly black male as I am, or one that's small. Do you realize that even uh, 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 now, I remember when I was uh, speaking in Omaha a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago, uh, I was tired, but I had on a suit, tie. I was clean as a chicken. And I sat by, down, this is a true story, and this is what you have to understand if you're a black man in this country, you have to understand this, no matter what your degree or pedigree. I sat down uh, at this table, and a white woman had her purse there. Now, I was the guest speaker. And when I sat down by her purse, she moved closer to it, and she took it. And I saw her, and I said to her, ma'am, uh, I am about stealing purses the way I am about drinking. I never do either one before noon. <laughs> now she said to me, I didn't mean any harm. It was her feeling about me. I was threatening. I was going to steal from her. Now, you know, she wished she had never done that because I was the guest speaker and I wore her out in the speech. And she'll never been... <laughs> but, but I'm just saying that, that the black male is a threatening force. The young black male, even more so than that. And that's, that's what's fear of the black family, the public uh, enemy. I'm trying to say, whatever your degree is, if you're a black male, you're suspect, no matter how old you are. That's the Charles Stewart thing. The black woman is considered less threatening to the white male, and it is a way to create diversion and conflict between the black female and the black male over nothing and listen to Revolutionary Generation on Public Enemy. I, I'm, I'm pushing Public Enemy because I'm on that now. No, not you. You sit up there trying to be cool. Trying, no, we got somebody else. We'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> we talk, I saw somebody else over here. Yeah. Now, we'll get, Chicago, what high school? Lindbergh. Lindbergh, right. Oh, one or two Lindbergh. <laughs> where, where, where are you from Whitney? Whitney Young. Uh, they get all they get, they get the cream of the cribs and they, they skim off the top. See, see they, they don't get all of their students like me and you. See, so they don't count. They are, they are a magnet school. <laughs> Go ahead. Terrible. Terrible. 
Well, yeah, what, the question is how do I feel about Chicago politics? See, when Harold Washington was elected, it came as a surprise to a lot of people, black and white. And, and, and the way Chicago politics had been built was on the premise of the plantation politics. The plantation system, and I think I, I would commend that you would read Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. He talks about how the plantation system was structured, where you had the white masa on top, you had a white overseer who was poor, who didn't have any land, but he worked for the white masa, and then they selected a black driver from the masses of slaves. Well, that's the way Daly ran Chicago. They always had black faces, but they always were beholding to the mayor and not to the people. Excuse me, when Harold was elected, the black people elected Harold so that people who were put in were responsible to the people and not to the white politicians. Many of the people who lived on Harold on the plantation before Harold's election were very angry at the independence of blacks and that they, they were not getting the largesse. When Harold died, they surfaced again. So they are now flocking to Richard M. Daly as his flunky or his Negroes in residence and creating all sorts of confusion in the black community. I don't know what's going to happen. Eugene Pinchin should be the president of the county board now, except there was so much division in the black community, we were unable to pull together the vote. But we didn't get to Harold overnight, and so we're not going to stop fighting until we bring some more fairness back to there. I mean, daily, 60 some odd percent of all of the people he's hired since he's been there last May have been white. They're eliminating black professionals at the Board of Education and blacks in the city. We're going to take it back. Blacks in Chicago are now, by their own calculation, almost 50% of the population. White, uh, the white population in Chicago is a minority population, yet they have a minority set-aside program for blacks and women. I mean, you know, really, if you're going to have it, it really should be for, for whites. This brother here. No, don't you leave. I promise him right here, and he's going to pull his head off for me. That's right. All right. I'm Mike. Don't leave. I, I'm going to see you. Yes, sir. From Whitney right. Young in Chicago. Right. Um, earlier, you elaborated on how they mold laws to um, do what they want. I wonder if you could uh, compare how they exterminate, how they kill the Indians to what they're trying to do to the black men today. Well, the extermination of the, of the Indian, of course, is one of the saddest chapters in this, uh, in this, in this country. And every time I see it, uh, the black male is under siege. And Haki Budabuti has a new book out on the black male. Uh, several persons. Uh, most, there are 420 some odd thousand black males in higher education and 600 and some odd thousand young black males in the prison system or the criminal justice system. Uh, I tried to illustrate uh, with the uh, substantial crimes where people go to jail for nothing. Most of those persons are black males, are Hispanic males, are poor whites. If you go into the prison system, now extermination, uh, there's no doubt about it, in my opinion, uh, that whether it's a concerted plan or whether it is a, a plan which is just working, there is at this time in this country an assault on young black males. Uh, the other thing that is happening and that we have to understand is that the white birth rate in this country now is almost zero. That if if Hispanics and blacks continue to have children and whites continue to have children the way that they are, then uh, Time Magazine calls it the browning of America. America will become a city, I mean a country of non-white persons. Uh, I believe 